come up here. So thanks for having me here. First, the usual disclosures. I've started a bunch of companies. I consult for a bunch of companies. My students have started a bunch of companies. You shouldn't believe another word I'm about to say. Uh, if you haven't heard, we're in the middle of this data deluge. Some of you have heard me speak before. Know that uh, I'm a big fan of this data deluge. Uh, the Economist had a special issue about two years ago uh, indicating that this year, uh, in 2012, we will be generating, as a human species, two zettabytes of data this year, right? So those of you who don't know your metric prefixes, it goes kilo, mega, giga, tera, petabyte, exabyte, zettabyte. In fact, next year we will have four zettabytes of data. Four zettabytes. Of course, this is all the YouTube videos, this is all the songs, all the movies, and of course, all the interesting scientific data as well. Scientific data in many fields, certainly particle physics, cosmology, uh, astronomy, and of course, life science research as well. In fact, we have so much data now that uh, this article, I'm a huge fan of this article by Chris Anderson, who until recently was the editor-in-chief of Wired, says we've collected so much data that science itself is growing obsolete. Okay? So how do you make this leap, right? You gotta think about this. The scientific method, right, the good old-fashioned scientific method was let's go come up with an interesting question, interesting hypothesis, and then go make the measurements to test that hypothesis or that question. And now we're in a world where we have so much data, okay? We have the measurements already. The new magic is in figuring out what's the question to ask. What is the cool question that actually the whole world has been waiting to know this answer and the whole world doesn't even realize it's an askable question already because someone's made these measurements. Right? Those are the magical kind of questions we try to get to. You ask people in my lab, 99% of the work in my lab now is figuring out what's the cool question we want to ask. The minute you figure out the question, the code kind of writes itself, the database architecture, everything writes itself, the infrastructure. But if there's no kind of core neat question there, you're writing code for nothing, essentially, in the end. So of course, we have a lot of this in life science research. Uh, there's a great article in uh, Harvard Business Review Harvard Business Review, if you're starting up a lab, I highly recommend reading Harvard Business Review. It's a great way to learn all sorts of neat insights into how to manage a team of prima donnas. Uh, and I only mean that in a good way. Uh, if your lab is like mine, you know what the, your folks are like. Uh, this is a great article called The Next Scientific Revolution by Microsoft, Microsoft Research that indicated that in the early thousands, from the year zero to thousand, we had this idea of using theory. Then we moved in the 1700s to experimentation the 1800s, 1900s to simulation and computation. Think about model organisms, model this, model that, and now we're into data mining. Nature says that it is shameful if we don't use the data that's out there. Science says we need to make this data maximally available. And even the Lancet says if we don't use this data, it's an impediment to public health. What kind of data am I talking about? A lot of what I'm gonna be talking about is data from this type of device. On the left here is a standard Affymetrix gene chip. This happens to be the U133, the workhorse in terms of measuring a genome's amount of RNA. Essentially, every gene in the genome, every transcriptome is measurable by this kind of chip. If you haven't seen one of these, it's the size of your thumbnail. Here's a thumbnail, here's the chip. And we know that you can measure every gene in the genome on a single chip. Those of us who have uh, bigger needs, uh, deeper needs, who have the robots, can obviously make this in 96 well format. This is, uh, I guess, the lineup for those Axiom robots. Each one of these is one of these wells. So now you can measure them 96 at a time. Now what's amazing about this is that obviously we can measure entire genomes amount of RNA. We're talking about RNA, not DNA or prote proteins here. But you gotta remember, this is now a 15-year-old commodity item. Most people don't even care which company they're ordering from, right? Affy, Agilent, Illumina, it doesn't matter which one's the cheapest one on your campus. And everyone runs microarrays now. It's not a big deal to run even 100 microarray experiments. It's not a big deal at all. In fact, everyone runs microarrays on all of our campuses. All of our major tertiary care hospitals have these types of setups. And everyone writes papers and submits papers. And what happened in the early 2000s is that the journals, in a spark of wisdom, said no more papers on microarrays unless you deposit that data into an international repository. So other people can kind of double check your math. It's kind of getting more important to double check some of that math because some of these things are becoming real diagnostics for patients. So we've got to make sure we understand what's happening with those samples. And then maybe someday someone else could do something else with those samples. And I'm here to try to convince you we are already there today that you can do amazing things with the samples that are out there. How many samples are actually out there? Most people know about gene shows. Very few people realize how much data is actually publicly available. As of August 1st, there was a special article in uh, Nature, featured my lab, had this kind of bar chart. As of August 1st this year, we reached 1 million 
publicly available microarrays. One million of them. Actually, today, we're in the middle of December, we're at a million eighty thousand. Okay, just from August to now, we add another eighty thousand. If it looks like the growth is slowing here, it's only because they counted it from half the year. Okay, so it's still growing exponentially, doubling about every two years or so. Unending growth here. This is amazing. You could say all you want about high throughput sequencing and RNA seq, and of course that data is already in geo as well. But migrates are selling like crazy for these guys. Okay, it's not our necessarily our institutions, the top tier institutions that are buying more migrates. But it's all these other institutions that have never even run a microarray before, right? And this is their first time even buying those scanners, and there's still a huge community of folks still attracted to this. But when I mean microarrays, I just mean RNA measurements in general. So if you go to NCBI Geo, the Gene Expression Omnibus at uh, uh, NIH, you can see 840,000 arrays there. The Europeans run their own repository, another quarter million there. So you add it up, it's about 1.07, 1.08 million microarrays available, doubling every two to three years. Just to make this kind of hit home, I use this exp uh, example all the time, even a high school kid, right? A high school kid who needs to do a science fair project, you have them in your labs in the summer, I have them in my labs, they can go to this website, she can simply type breast cancer and now start to download 34,000 samples of breast cancer, <laughs> right? As easily as she could find a song on iTunes today. That's the data from 1,300 independent experiments. Boy, you know, if you think about something about breast cancer, it's kind of probably already been done at this point, right? And still people add more data, right? 34,000 samples, digital samples of breast cancer. What can a high school kid do? She can look at this data and realize, you know, there's three groups of investigators out there. There's a group that basically takes samples from the operating room or from a biopsy from re real human patients, and then they believe that's the way to study breast cancer. Then you got a middle group, they're saying, well, the only way to really study breast cancer is use cell lines. We've been using these cell lines for 20 years, that's the way to study breast cancer. Then you got this other camp that says the only way to study breast cancer is to use mouse models, because they're the ones, this is the only way we're going to tweak it, you can treat these mice. And they're, they're saying that's the only way to treat breast cancer, or to study breast cancer. And even a high school kid can come in the middle and just say, I don't care to join any one of these kind of silos or these camps. I want to figure out what's in common across everyone. What, is the, what are the genes that the biopsy folks, the cell line folks, the mouse folks are all finding together? You can see this theme coming again and again in the work that I'm going to show you, the anecdotes, that there's power in the numbers. When you look at 100 or 1,000 people studying the same condition from different angles, it's, there's incredible power to see what's in common in that type of experiment. By the way, if you really be, don't believe a high school kid can do this, I'm most proud of these five high school kids that have placed in either Intel, Westinghouse, or Siemens semi-finalist or finalist competition in the past three years just from my lab, including Andrew Liu made it to number two science kid in the country. So to make it to one of these semi-finalists, you're one of the top 200 or 300 science kids in the country. <laughs> so even a high school kid can truly do this and get na nationwide uh, uh, prominence just for, uh, while still being in high school. If RNA is not your thing, oh, so by the way, before I leave RNA, I'm not even counting for breast cancer another 860 samples from TCGA, Cancer Genome Atlas, hardly anyone using this data. Thousands of cancer samples. But of course here, you don't just get the RNA, in some cases you get RNA-seq, you also get the methylation profiles, you also get the histopath images. And in some cases, you even get the CAT scan or the mammography images, what the clinical test was that led to this hunk of tumor getting taken out. All available. Click to download. If RNA is not your thing, here's the DNA, what I was saying. DNA, the stick is even harder. It's not from the journals that make you share it, it's from the NIH and Wellcome Trust. If you're doing genetics research, especially GWAS or genome sequencing, and they funded you, you got to put your data out here. And here, we're a little bit more finicky. Obviously, with DNA, we don't want kids to go re-identify people off of a, you know, a cup that they've left in the cafeteria, right? We care a little bit more about DNA. So here, you got to click to download permission forms, you get IRB approval, your ethics board, and then eventually you get your hands on the data. And here, the, the stick is so hard from NIH that you have to share your data before you've published. So we give them these embargo dates. You're not allowed to write your own paper on this data unless they get a chance to write their papers. Of course, you could easily eyeball. By the time you get to the, that website, more than half of the embargo dates are already passed. They're already expired. You're free and clear. Why is it worth all of that hassle? I just want to show you here in the middle, at the top here, rather, the entire Framingham Heart Study. Okay, why is that neat, the Framingham Heart Study? Framingham Heart Study is this amazing 30-year-old study. It was funded by NHLBI. Framingham's about, I don't know, 15 miles west of Boston. It's the reason why we know the word cholesterol 
in the United States. Okay, that's the study that gave it to us. We figured out the longitudinal risk. It's a longitudinal study. They've been looking at everyone in the city of Framingham plus their descendants. They know where they lived, who was the social network, who was friends with whom, who lived near whom. And it's kind of cool to now to download 14,000 people's DNA. That's kind of interesting, but more amazing to me is downloading 30 years of clinical and research measurements on these humans just sitting there. Now, why is that amazing? Because before this, to go get your hands on the Framingham Heart Study data, you used to have to go work there. They didn't have to share anything until now because we have data transparency. We've got all these funding agencies. I'm not saying any of this stuff is perfect, right? There are a lot of people that kind of sneak through the cracks here, but it's amazing how much data we do get in the public uh, eye this way. I just became PI of this one, import. NIAID, allergy and infectious disease. They're the ones who look at transplant and HIV and tuberculosis. They said, well, we, they have flow cytometry data. They have HLA data, stuff that NCBI wasn't handling. So they funded the creation of this one called import for all those immune measurements plus the clinical trials. Another new aspect that we're not used to seeing publicly available, you're gonna see on import and other sites are actual clinical trials data, especially for trials that failed. It kind of would be neat for any of us to go in and figure out why did these trials fail and actually see maybe there is something here that we can even salvage some of these clinical trials. That kind of data is going to be publicly available through import. If you're a chemical guy or a drug discovery guy, this is even more astounding. PubChem. Hardly anyone uses PubChem. Hardly anyone's even heard of PubChem. It came out of uh, Elias Erhoni's roadmap initiatives trying to fund academics to uh, screen drugs using uh, cell lines and um, uh, um, reporter assays. The way to think about PubChem is think of a grid of 108 million columns. Those are the drugs or chemicals, 108 million columns and 650,000 rows. Every row here is, is a separate screening assay or bioassay, a cancer cell that glows if it's dying or glows if it's living. 650,000 this way, 108 million this way. If you do the math, that's 70 trillion cells of which 1 billion of them have some number measured by some scientist somewhere in the past six years. And you don't even need a user ID and password to get to this one. Now, I'm willing to bet anyone in this audience a beer easily. This will beat what any one pharmaceutical company has in terms of their own screening data, right? I'm even willing to bet you a bottle of wine. This probably beats what they all have combined because this doubles every two years. And nothing in drug discovery in pharmaceutical land is doubling anymore. They're laying off people, right? And this is all available click to download. Sitting in there are the next drugs for the next disorder that you wish to go pursue. And you know there's not enough people on planet Earth to even figure out all these different cells and all these measurements here. Amazing time that we give this stuff away. Now, where we used to get stuck, though, as computational folks, where we used to get stuck is how do we take all this, turn the crank? Yeah, we can do that. We can figure out new drugs for diseases. We can figure out this is a new blood test for this cancer. And then we got to slow down and talk to the biologists for a minute. And then we got to try to convince them to run these experiments for us or give us their precious samples, right? I really think that this is a good uh, drug for this cancer. Or I think this is a great uh, blood test for a particular leukemia. We had an example where we were looking at leukemia. We used computational approach, public data, we figured out a great serum protein, the serum blood test for acute, leuke acute myeloid leukemia. It's kind of the worst kind of leukemia to get. And so what do we do? Well, we go to our cancer center at Stanford. We're NCI funded. We ask them, did you save any serum or plasma? Maybe we have a biorepository. We do have a great biorepository at Stanford. Do we have any serum or plasma so we can test this protein that we predicted? And of course, Stanford, they've saved all the RNA. They've saved all the cancer cells. It just turns out they never saved any of the liquid around the cells. You need a lot more freezers for that. And so strategic decisions are made. And they said, well, you don't, we don't happen to have the samples you need. Go get IRB approval. Put up those posters. You see posters everywhere. Go join these trials. In about a year, you should have enough samples to test your computational prediction. And what does a computational guy like, I, like me do? We just Google for it. And this is the most eye-opening thing that's happened to me in the last five years. We Google for samples. They even look like vacutainers here. Browse by disease. This is a company called Conversant. We've, again, for this, I'm only a customer. I, I don't represent these companies here. I'm a customer. Browse by disease. What type of sample do you want to buy today? Bladder cancer, brain cancer, breast cancer. Here's leukemia. What exactly do you want to buy? Do you want to buy a bone marrow sample? CD19 positive, CD45 bone marrow, mononucleus cell bone marrow, T cell, 
Peripheral blood B cell sorted. Next page. Peripheral blood plasma. Okay, that'll work for me. Click on that. $55 each. So we buy them all now. And we start to validate our markers. The folks that are chuckling in the front realize it would probably take 10 to 20 times that amount to get it on your own campus, okay? Forget about the year you're gonna to need to recruit this. This shows up in 72 hours on dry ice, waiting for you to do something with it. And it's amazingly easy to order. How many samples do you want per patient? What disease subtype? How many units? Where does this come from? By the way, these are major hospitals, essentially in the middle of nowhere in the United States. They're gonna throw these samples out. Companies come in, strip off the identifiers, put on some organizing stuff, and basically resell it for research, just sitting there. You're, when you click to order this stuff, you're not supposed to re-identify any of these folks. You're just getting serum or plasma. You're not going to get DNA. So in other words, this was on its way to the trash. That these companies have come in and started to organize this to make it easier for us. Well, that's great. You can actually do this for pathology samples. You can get pathology samples, tissue microarrays. But the, then the, the purists, the biologists say, you know, this is all great. This is descriptive research. But they're not convinced unless you show it in a mouse model, right? Show it to me in a mouse model that this drug works, or this, is a great, this, is, this gene is relevant for this particular disease. And then I show them assaydepot.com, okay? I'm sure you've all been to Home Depot, okay? Assay Depot, these guys are actually in La Jolla. They're, it's a virtual company, actually. It's just a clearinghouse. Click on pharmacology. What type of mouse do you want to run today? Bone, cardiovascular, dermatology, diabetes, urinary, infectious disease, Inflammation, neurology, cancer, eye, ear, pain, respiratory. I'm a diabetes guy. You're going to see a bunch of diabetes stories. Here's an OB, OB diabetes model, 16 mice. Take these 16 mice, divide them up into two groups of eight, four groups of four. These mice have been eating a lot and getting diabetes since the 1950s. <laughs> Discovered Jackson Labs. They've, that's what these mice do. You can test any drug you want, whatever number of groups you want. 28-day study, they'll look at the fasting sugar, the uh, insulin tolerance test, glucose tolerance test, and you'll know if your drug is working. You send a drug blinded to them or not, and you can just figure out whether this is working or not. Now, what am I covering up? The price, $9,000 for this service, nine-week turnaround time, and literally add to shopping cart. <laughs> An entire mouse experiment is purchasable with a credit card with e-commerce today. It's an amazing world. This was developed for us, okay? Us, meaning us in this room. Why do I say that? Because the mouse biologists, they look at this and say, $9,000 for a 60 mouse experiment? That is insanely expensive, right? And it's true because they have slaves, I mean graduate students, that can do this kind of work much cheaper than this, right? But for, for us who work in dry benches, right? Offices and cubicles. The minute we get mouse data, it's a massive value add to our papers, our patents, our companies, right? To take it off of just a list of genes and to show it in a mouse is an amazing amount of progress in your own finding. And so to me, this is amazing that we can do this. Now, some of you with sharp eyes notice this is run in China. Now, some of you may have a problem with this, some of you not. But let me tell you what actually happens. I just gave a Chinese lab as an example. When you hit add to shopping cart, you will see all 133 companies or labs who are willing to offer this as a service to you. And over the subsequent 48 hours, all 133 companies are competing for your business. Oh, we'll throw in Illuminix for free. Oh, we'll double them. This We have a special, a Christmas special, okay? <laughs> Including Maryland, Wisconsin, and all over the world. So this is not, when I'm saying outsourcing, I don't mean offshoring necessarily. It could be your neighboring lab that has excess capacity. But now, if you really want to be picky about data, well, let's say you need a USDA-approved lab. There's four of those. If you need an FDA-approved lab, click here. You only see the five. ISO 9001, seven, triple ALAC, 28. You click on the certifications you need, you're only presented with those labs that have that certification. Oh, man, I wish I could do this with my collaborators at Stanford, okay? To know exactly how, how, how do you know to, how you're doing this experiment? These guys are going to certify it here, right? It's an amazing world. And for the one person in this audience, I know there's always one who's dying to ask me about the quality of the research results you get here. I will simply answer, order two of them. It's cheap enough. You'll see in the data I show you, we'll order one from the West Coast, one from the East Coast. 
if you really want to know if this data is working, if this drug is working, just order two of them at that price. How many biologists go to their neighboring lab and ask them to completely reproduce this experiment? They never do that. So we will always trump the quality issue because we'll buy three of them. We'll buy four of them, right? How many independent labs do you want to have that finding actually show up in? That's easy to beat today. So it's an amazing world that we can outsource this part. It's commodity service. In fact, if you think of the translational pipeline, by translational pipeline, I mean bench to bedside. We make these clinical and molecular measurements with high throughput measurements uh, increasingly today. We ask an interesting question, run a trial. We apply those statistical computational methods that we're all experts at. And then we might validate in second phase a drug or a biomarker. I'm simply going to argue three out of the four today are commodity items or services. We're already drowning in the molecular measurements. We have plenty of them publicly available. Man, do we have computational tools. I'm going to argue that we make too many tools. And if we're, not, we're not using our own tools enough. But we have plenty of websites that do whatever you want. And the validation to test that, get that sample of pathology, serum, test that, that's all commodity item today as well. The one part that I tell my students that will never be outsourced is asking good questions. Everything else in my lab, we say, we have a motto, outsource everything but the question now. Right? Why do we need a quarter million dollar cluster? Run on, on Amazon. Why do we need to have this mouse done here? Let's go buy a service out of that. The only thing that's not outsourceable ever is asking damn good questions. And that's where I keep coming back to is the magic today. Let me just take this to an extreme. In Silicon Valley here, we're so used to starting companies in garages, major companies, HP, Apple. We're used to starting companies in dorm rooms. You think about Yahoo, Google, of course, Facebook. I really believe the next Genentech is going to start in someone's garage the next Amgen, the next Biogen. Because in your garage, you have one million microarrays and every mouse model in the world. And all that's left is to get a pretty big ass credit card to order this stuff, right? And even that's not too hard with seed funding, crowdfunding. You could go for the traditional VCs to do this. How much more do you need to actually start a biotech company in your garage today? Just think about that one. And you're gonna see examples of kind of garage biotechs as they come out of my lab, and I'll give you a couple examples as we go forward here. So I'm just going to give you a couple anecdotes, you know, in the kind of remaining time. First is a paper that just came out in uh, PNAS a couple months ago. It's, to, it's my pride and joy paper that really kind of puts it all together and kind of ha hammers it home. And it's a paper that's really focused around type 2 diabetes. Now, why type 2 diabetes? Some of you call this adult onset diabetes. It's the same thing. It is the public health menace of the world. We already got 170 million people getting this disorder. In the United States, a third of all kids born after year 2000, a third of all kids are going to end up with type 2 diabetes now, knocking anywhere from 10 to 30 years off their life. Now, why do we get it? Why do we have type 2 diabetes? A lot of sociocultural issues. We have a 1,000 channels of TV now for kids to watch. We don't have recess in high school anymore. We have cheesecake factory-sized portions. Moms and dads don't feel safe letting their kids play outside. We have a million reasons why. But at a biochemical molecular level, we're still kind of clueless. Why do people end up with type 2 diabetes? It's kind of a big mystery. We still need new drugs for type 2 diabetes all the time. We have had drugs for 30 plus years. We still come up with new ones. I just give as one example these DPP4 inhibitors that kind of alter as a counter regulatory hormone. I'm going to give this as an example because it came out in 2008. First year sales, $1 billion. First year, and as of now, this, this class of uh, drug made it already to $4 or $5 billion a year. In other words, I'm just saying we still desperately need new drugs for type 2 diabetes. So let's run microarrays. Everyone's been running microarrays. Here was our contribution 10 years ago in PNAS when I was in Boston at the Johnson Diabetes Center. People around the world have been taking samples from diabetics, samples from non-diabetics, run them on microarrays. This was a muscle experiment, 187 genes different. And then you get stuck. What do you do with these 187 genes? Everyone get their, gets their own list of 100 or 200 and 300, and he kind of gets stuck. Now, the approach that we're taking really comes from this paper. And this was a very influential paper that basically nobody saw. No one's even recognized this paper. But I'm just giving a shout out to this paper, Nature Methods, April 2009. And it's a very important paper to think about, especially for our community. This paper comes from the mouse psychiatrists, OK? Think about that one for a second. The mouse psychiatrist. And they're trying to study anxiety and depression in mice. Okay, And of course, if you don't agree, what does it mean to have a mouse that's anxious 
if this lab and this lab don't agree, of course they're going to get different answers, right? I think this mouse is depressed. No, that mouse is not depressed, right? And they're going to get different answers in their genes. And they're having this problem for 10 plus years, and all of a sudden the community says, this is ridiculous. None of our answers are reproducing. Let's standardize on what we call depression and anxiety in a mouse. You got to take a mouse, single cage, put in this kind of maze, do this to it, and that's what it means to test it for depression or anxiety. And then all of a sudden the field realized, my goodness, all of our answers are reproducing. It's working. The labs are getting the same answers now. But the problem was, as illustrated in this figure here, the minute you change one element of the study design, put two mice per cage, use a different strain, give it different water, give it different food, none of the answers were holding up. Now, we know what happened in our field. That's called overfitting. They overfit their model because they so agreed on one way to do it that they got perfectly reproducible answers that did not generalize. And the minute they tweak one parameter, all those answers were for naught. This controversial paper said, came out and says, why on earth are we standardizing anymore? We should deliberately try many ways to study anxiety and depression. You try your favorite way. You try your favorite way. And if anything holds up in more people's experiments, maybe it's only 80% of experiments we get this gene showing up or that particular factor showing up. If it holds up at the end, then maybe that is the resilient, the robust finding. It's a very controversial way to think about it. You can all participate in these consortia like I do. And the first thing they do is get the data standards committee going. Yeah, we can agree on file formats, but then they say we got to do this study this way. We got to think about the phenotypes this way. And I'm actually not a big fan of that anymore. You call your hypertension your way. I'm going to call it my way. Let's see if there's something in common here, right? Because no one said the one in common is the right way to study it either. So now think about this in silico. Instead of that one micro experiment, today if you look on the internet, you can find 130 publicly available experiments on diabetes, where someone's looked at diabetes and normal, diabetes and normal, diabetes and normal. But they could have looked at liver, muscle, fat, beta cells, those are cells in your pancreas making the insulin, or they could have looked at rat, mouse, or human. Three species, four tissues. We're asking a deliberately naive question. What's in common? What's in common across everyone's experiments? Well, let's just go make a list of every gene and genome, just count how, how often it's differentially expressed. We're reanalyzing all this raw data. Imagine a graph that goes from 0 to 130. It would be about here. And this is the actual data here. You could just start with just the background genes, 25,000 genes in the genome. Turns out about a quarter of the genes in the genome show up in one person's experiment. It's not hard to get some gene to show up in some person's experiment somewhere. And then there's a quick long tail with these kind of weird bumps in the middle here. It gets harder to get 20 experiments. Your gene to show up in 30 experiments, 60 experiments. It gets progressively harder. Now, before we start to run some mouse models here, we've got to make sure we've got some signal. We know a bunch of genes involved with type 2 diabetes, including GWAS hits, drug targets, t 7 l 2 is a, a GWAS hit. And all I'm trying to show you here is that all the known genes for type 2 diabetes are shifted over to the right compared to all the other genes in the genome. You can just see that if it's a known gene, it shows up in more people's micro-experiments than the, basically the background, the rest of the genes in the genome. So we're staring at this, and we're staring at this, and we're staring at this, and then we notice, what's this tiny little red dot out here? This is a gene that's showing up in more people's experiments than any other gene in the genome. And it's more positive than any other known gene for type 2 diabetes. So of course we're going to study this one. So we look at its name, and it's a CD molecule. Okay, that, for the aficionados, means it's a gene that goes for a protein that sits on a cell surface. That makes it interesting to some immunologists someday in the past who knows how to flow sort on it. Okay, you could sort cells with a CD, this protein. So it's a CD molecule. And then we're looking at it, and we're looking at it, and we realize it's not just a cell surface protein, it's a functional receptor. That means it binds ligands and turns things on inside the cell or turns them off. If you go a little bit lower here, this red dot is the ligand for that receptor. Just sitting there in 130 people's experiments, actually in 78 people's experiments here. So we started a deep collaboration with Takashi Kadawaki in many labs in Japan. This all worked on by Keichi Kodama, who happens to be Japanese in my lab. He just reached out of his network and said, let's get this, this, let's get this thing studied. And where you didn't see a collaborator, you know how we can get the mouse work done now. 
okay? But we work with collaborators and you'll see their names so showing up completely. So how do we pursue this? Go back to the database. Well, the database says, if you're gonna pick a tissue to study, look at the fat, because the fat experiments really seem to make this thing change compared to the islet cells, the muscle, and the liver. So you're gonna see some fat pictures in a minute. And this graph just says 90% of the fat experiments where the receptor changed, the ligand also changed. So that's what we would call an autocrine effect. That's probably the ligand and the receptor in the same tissue. So great, working with collaborators, we get black six, see if it's some black six mice, get, give them a normal diet, high fat diet, receptor goes up in RNA, immunohistochemistry, you can see that there is receptor here, but it's not in the fat cells. It turns out it's in these immune cells, these inflammatory cells between the fat cells, kind of interesting. And there happen to be macrophages, I'll just tell you that. These macrophages are making this receptor. So it's not even in the fat cell. Why does that matter? Because if you do a fat cell, cell line, you're never gonna find this thing, okay? You have to look at real tissue because the real tissue isn't just one kind of cell. It's got inflammatory cells, it's got all sorts of other things in there. This just shows that the ligand and receptor are co-expressed by qPCR as we predicted. So the very next step, what you would do to test this receptor is to go make a knockout mouse of this thing, right? That would be the next step. And then we look at Jackson Labs. The immunologist knocked out this receptor 11 years ago, and they never looked at the sugar level of the mouse sitting there. That's how siloed science is. When that biologist says, yeah, we knocked out that gene, didn't see a phenotype, to you it, mean, it shouldn't mean squat. They might not have tested it for the disease you think that gene is relevant for. More than half the mouse genome has been knocked out most of it's sitting in an ES cell in some catalog. 500 bucks, you can make that ES cell into a mouse on your campus today. You just gotta start to order these things and realize you can actually buy these mice. You don't have to, if you're starting from scratch, 15,000 bucks gets you a knockout mouse today. It's not impossible to do for a computational person. So let's go get that mouse. MAC2 stain for macrophages. By eye, you can see less infiltrate, not 100% gone but most of those macrophages are probably gone. This quantitates that, but how does it do functionally? It turns out the knockout mouse is insulin sensitive. Now, what does that mean? When you knock out this receptor, it doesn't die from diabetes. It does better than the wild type with insulin. At the same weight, the sugar level, fasting sugar level, glucose tolerance test, insulin tolerance test, normal fat, high fat diet, in every assay, the knockout mouse does better than the wild type. That's why it was missed. You, you know when the biologist knocks out a gene, they're kind of hoping the mouse dies sooner than the wild type, because then you can figure out what this gene did. This one doesn't have a problem with the sugar being higher. It's better than the wild type. That's why it's missed, unless you look for it. Everything is pointing to now telling us knocking out the function of this receptor would make an awesome therapeutic target for human type 2 diabetes. Well, let's go to humans. It's so easy to buy fat from humans. Liposuction. <laughs> Here's a 37 BMI woman who probably had liposuction. We don't know. It's all de-identified. You can buy slides like this for a couple hundred dollars, 57 years old, chock full of macrophages making this particular CD receptor. In fact, humans make so much of this receptor, it leaches into the blood. There's a soluble form in the blood. Well, that's a $500 ELISA kit. The level in the blood correlates with this lab test called hemoglobin A1C. By the way, that's the test we measure in diabetics. And it turns out the higher the sugar level, the higher this particular receptor is in your blood, or conversely, the lower the lower. Everything is telling us lower is better, lower is better. By the way, these 55 folks don't even have diabetes yet. So it's already going up before we even, as a doctor, call them as having diabetes. Everything is telling us lower is better, we said, let's just get to the punchline and make a drug on this one. So how would you make a drug? The simplest possible drug you can make against a receptor is a simple anti-receptor antibodies. So let's take wild-type mice, high-fat diet, get them plump and ready to have diabetes. We're going to treat them with anti-receptor antibodies. And by the time, before you asked me, did you buy blocking antibodies? We went to biocompare.com and found 200 companies make anti-mouse receptor antibodies here. We picked the first one off the list. If that failed, we'd probably pick the second one. A couple hundred dollars to buy these antibodies. And what happens? In one week, administering this prototype drug, we can wipe out that inflammatory infiltrate, and in seven days, we can lower their blood sugar. So now let's recap here. We've got a brand new prototype therapy for diabetes. 
I told you the kind of last one started at a billion dollars a year. We've got prototype therapy, that blood test, you could argue could be called a serum companion diagnostic, at least that's what the drug companies would call it. We've got the knockout mouse, the immunohistochemistry, the human data. It took about 18 months of biology using the same data any high school kid can get to today. I don't trust any one of those 130 experiments, but I trust what's in common across them. Right? I don't need to believe any one of them, but there's safety in those numbers there. Something's showing up again and again, you kind of want to pursue it, especially when the biologists aren't pursuing these things. So is this an N of 1? That's been published. By the way, the receptor CD44, the hyaluronic acid receptor, ligands SPP1. I can go into endless details about CD44. All I'm going to say is it's a complicated receptor, lots of alternative splicing. There have been, uh, the biggest problem with CD44 is that it was, it was discovered in 1985. In fact, so many people study it in the early days, so few people study it today, it doesn't even have good gene ontology uh, annotation because no one's really publishing much on CD44 anymore. Remember, gene ontology curates today's papers. They don't go back 20 years, right? So even the gene ontology classifications are pretty weak on this particular receptor. CD44 happens to also be a marker for cancer stem cells of various kinds. I can go into details if you're curious there. All I'm going to say is it's so much more fun now to study this biology of the inflammation type 2 diabetes, knowing we can actually have a drug here. It's so much more fun to study biology this way. Is this of N of 1? We have so many programs going in my lab. Let me just pick another one. Work by Ron Chen, Pravesh Khatri, in our collaborating labs, Alhamdulillah Sri Kader and Julian Sage's lab. Let's just repeat the same thing for non-small cell lung cancer, NSCLC. Only seven data sets available, where someone looked at cancer, normal, cancer, normal. You can see your favorite people here. These are well-known. Some of these are incredibly old data sets. HUFL, that's what the Whitehead was using back before the 2000 era, okay? 700 samples, cancer samples, 128 normal samples. Simple, stupid, naive question. What's upregulated in all of them? Only 16 genes, including another receptor, tyrosine kinase. Now, in my lab, we love receptors, and we love kinases, and we really love it when it's the same molecule because those are druggable today. We can try to figure out how to make a drug against a receptor tyrosine kinase. So we take fresh NSCLC samples from Stanford, flow sort them. Yes, we know it's not just RNA. It's sitting on a uh, cell surface. There's actual protein there. We can buy shRNA to knock it down by one, by the other one. The second one seems to work better, knocks it out by Western. Knock it down. Put into cells, cleave caspase goes up. That means these cells are self-destructing, apoptosis. Take these cells, knock it out again, put it into a mouse, and you can see the tumors are shriveling. Now that's six weeks of biology, not 18 months anymore. Now we know what the hell we're doing. Six weeks of biology after six days of informatics. And you just keep turning this crank. Brand new therapeutic. We've got prototype drug here, barely describing a prototype drug here. Novel therapeutic action, novel receptor. Fine, someone else can find a better drug here. But all we're saying is we're going to find these targets and we're going to validate them and we're going to keep moving on to the next disease. Because those folks have to share their data again and again and again. Well, let's keep going on then. So we have about 10 such programs going on in my lab now, scleroderma, lupus, pancreatic cancer, uh, mesothelioma, small cell lung cancer, uh, we've got lung adeno, we've got colon cancer. I've lost count of how many we have at this point. And in fact, the rotation project for most of my students now is go find a drug for this particular cancer. Another way we can get to a drug, so that's a long way to get to a drug, right? A long way because you still have to start the 10 years, one, two, three billion dollars to get from that receptor to a particular drug. Another way to get to drugs, though, is to kind of take advantage of existing drugs. And what we start to realize is instead of looking at just one disease at a time now, let's just go look at all the different diseases. So my first big NIH grant was just go to GEO and Array Express and just go get every human disease that's been studied by microarrays. Why are we just picking one at a time? Just go get them all. And we have a lot of papers published on how we do this. Yes, we text mine. We use UMLS Unified Medical Language System to text mine it. We human eyeball them to make sure they're there. We know how to convert an AFI array to an Illumina array to NCBI identifiers. We give those tools away. We know how to study the different, take the difference between diseases and not tissues. We're very picky here in these experiments. We're looking, again, at experiments are looking at disease and normal, disease and normal. They've got to have normals in there. 
And what we're going to do is norm, all the normals are going to pretend are the same, and disease is a deviation from normal. It turns out it's incredibly hard to figure out, does this experiment have normals in it? Okay. It turns out, we wrote a paper on this, there are 200 words for normal in GL. Okay. Normal, vehicle, wild type, control, time zero, margins are the top six. Okay. Non-diabetes, non-X, where X could be any disease, is a normal. So you have to have all sorts of heuristics there. That's why we gave away all our heuristics. This is to show that we can figure out, does this experiment have normals or not? And so that's why instead of all million arrays, we have tens of thousands of arrays here, 300 plus diseases this way, 20,000 genes this way, and we can normalize to, for the aficionados and audience. We rank normalize zero to one and evenly spaced fractions in between for every gene, and then we calculate the difference between these. So it's just, uh, I can go into details how we rank normalize and scale if you're really curious. And amazingly, as much as we have that kind of data on the diseases, disease and normals, disease and normals, then Justin Lamb and Todd Gollum and actually others have dumped out the same kind of data on the drug side. Specifically, talk about the connectivity map, but a brilliant database, starting with 150 drugs, now 1,500 drugs. Now they're on their way to thousands of drugs, tens of thousands. They've looked at the Affermetrix microarrays with drug, without drug, or with drug control, with drug control sitting there for more than a thousand different drugs. And we look at this, we naturally figure out, well, why can't we pair these two together, right? We have a lot of drugs there, some experimental drugs, but a lot of existing drugs. Why don't we start to pair these two together? And I'll make this kind of really simple statistics. Look at my arms, okay? If I've got a disease that makes this gene go up and this gene go down, and now I've got a drug that makes this gene go down and this gene go up, maybe there's a potential connection there. Okay, maybe I should try that disease, that drug for that particular disease. Now that's with two genes, imagine that across tens of thousands of genes, and you could test it by, by dumb luck, what would you just get by randomizing data? You get a p-value, q-value, false discovery rate. By a certain point, you got to shut off the computer and start to try these things, right? That's where it starts to get fun. Here's the first one of these that we tested. This came out in papers last year. I'm going to show you some new stuff at the end, don't worry. This is tropiramate, a seizure drug, epilepsy drug. An epilepsy drug, we said, should work on Crohn's disease or inflammatory bowel disease, a pretty nasty disease to have. Your body starts to autoimmune your intestines. The way to test this is in a rat. You give the rat TNBS up the butt. It starts to have Crohn's disease. By the way, we're not Crohn's disease experts. We read the papers like everyone else. We know how to order this stuff. We have Crohn's disease here. You give steroids a positive control. You know steroids will work on anti-inflammatory disorders. You don't want to keep patients on it long term kind of halts the progression, but you still see a lot of infiltrate here. And here is with topiramate, the seizure drug. It happens to be off patent. It's available and generic. It seems to be even better than prednisone. Well, now, this is great. We did great work in collaboration with Jay Pashfrika, who was the chair of GI, Stanford, Moan, Chinoy. I love these guys. They did this experiment for us. We know it was working, but they took iPhone pictures of the colon for us, for our paper. So we spent some science translation medicine, and they said, this is great. You got great data here. But man, these pictures, you got to get better data here, right? They just didn't know how to really take good pictures of the colon pathology. So we talked to Jay, and we said, let's go outsource this. We're not going to, we love you guys. You're already on the paper. Let's just go find two labs to do this. So literally, we go to Assay Depot. This is what Joel Dudley did with Marina Sirota. Joel Dudley goes to Assay Depot, finds, I think it was like 100 or 200 labs are willing to do this for us, okay, for money, of course. So we pick one out in Berkeley. We pick one in Berkeley because they were pretty cheap and they would do immune cytokines, okay? There's something called Luminex where you can just get 50 cytokines in the blood. They threw that in for free. And since we're looking at TNF alpha levels and stuff, that was, that was great to get that for free. And then we picked one, because I said East Coast, West Coast, right? We picked one out in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Why do we pick that one? Because they're the only ones in the world who knew how to do a rat colonoscopy. Any of you who are over age 50 know the size of a colonoscope, okay? And you can imagine what the size of a rat is. And these are incredibly tiny fiber optics, but these rats are still alive. And now you can see I'm not just cherry picking the pictures here, right? This is a normal rat colon. You can guess what the brown stuff is. You can see the red stuff here. That's Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. That's inflammatory bowel disease. Then here's a rat. Same chemical administered now with the seizure drug, topiramate. It's all clean. So when I'm talking about outsourcing these experiments, I'm not just doing it to save money. I'm doing it to get the best damn data in the world. 
Nobody at Stanford knew how to do a rat colonoscopy. So why not spend a few thousand dollars and get the best possible data for your prediction today? And this is exactly what I mean, that if you have any questions about quality, order from two labs, order from three labs. If you're really willing to stick by your computational prediction, this is what you should do to actually back this up. We did a second one because those folks at Science Fair and Social Medicine said, yeah, this is kind of cool, but did you, have you done it twice? Indeed, we did it twice. This one I'll just spend much less time on. This is a drug called cimetidine, Tagamet. You've seen the commercials for this one because it's for heartburn. It's available over the counter. You don't need a prescription. We predict it should work on lung cancer, a chemo, okay? So how do you test this one? You get a mouse without an immune system, a nude mouse put in, sprinkle in or inject in uh, human cancer cells, A549 cancer cells. If you do nothing, it triples in size in 11 days. It's a kind of vicious cancer for a mouse. In 11 days, it's tripling in size. If you give it doxorubicin, a known cancer drug, it only doubles in size. And the three in the middle happen to be that heartburn medicine. It's 25, 50, 100 milligrams per kilogram. So we know it works. In fact, we went so far, because this actually was costing so little for us, we actually went and tested a negative prediction. We said this drug, cimetidine, should never work on bladder cancer. So we just did that whole experiment just for the sake of doing a negative example. And we show in the paper it doesn't work at all. Then you can start to chase down the biology. We can now take the cells, sprinkle the drug on it. We know induces apoptosis directly. All I'm trying to say there is it's so much more fun to study the biology of a drug after you know it's working. I think about it for a second, the way the pharmaceutical companies work is almost exactly the reverse. That you're trying to figure out the biology and then eventually figure out if this drug is working or not. It's a, of course, it's much easier when starting with a known drug with known safety profile, we can do this. That's cool, this hasn't been published yet. Work with my same cast of characters, Joel Dudley, Nadine Chan Chan, Julian Ch uh, Sage, Alondra Sweet Cordero. This is a cool story. This is small cell lung cancer, pretty nasty lung cancer. Get kind of almost 100% mortality at some point within five years. And now instead of injecting cancer cells, we're making triple knockouts of cancer. What this means is you knock out P53, RB, P130. This mouse gets its own lung cancer. You can see all these spots here. What that means is you can't start the experiment on day zero. You got to start on day like seven months waiting for the mouse to get lung cancer. And this mouse is the same thing given a depression drug, a drug for depression. And this one, this doesn't slow the cancer, this melts the cancer, it's gone. Now this drug is still on pharmacy shelves, but the depression field has moved on to better drugs because this one had minor side effects for treating patients with depression, minor side effects, nothing as bad as having lung cancer, okay? This drug is on pharmacy shelves and we're showing it's working in mouse. Why am I giving you this example? We've got six out of six working so far. We've only published on two so far. Why am I most excited about this one? It's because we went from computational prediction, we showed it in cell line, I'm not even gonna show you that, we showed it in a mouse, and last month we got IRB approval to put it into humans, first patient already recruited, 15 months. This is how we in computational biology and bioinformatics should be writing our papers. Let's forget about just a list of genes, let's show it in patients now. This happens to be a repositioned drug, it happens to be available already in the pharmacy, we don't have to pay anyone anything, we got a seed grant to do it, and the first dose is already being given. I don't know if this drug is going to work or not. My hands are off of it because we had to turn it over to clinical trials folks. I just think it's amazing that people are going to listen to our predictions now and actually put these drugs into people. And that's what we should be shooting for, not just yet another BMC paper out of this stuff, right? This is what we can do. So kind of bring it home. Molecular, clinical, epidemiological data, I didn't even talk about the epi data and the tools already exist. We have plenty of plentiful amount of data, plentiful amount of tools. We can get to diagnostics, therapeutics, and novel disease mechanisms. I'm a huge fan of integration. Integration across scales, across modalities, across labs. I don't have to trust any one data set anymore because I have so many to choose from. I think what's in common seems to be pretty potent. For those of us in our field of computational biology and bioinformatics, our field has got to be more than just a, being about building tools for people. There are great tools that are out there, Cytoscape, we have so many others, Gene Pattern, we have so many great tools, but on average, those new grad students that start writing tools, it's a long shot whether your tool is actually gonna change the world or not just by putting it out on a website. But if you've built the tool that is the best tool in the world, show all of us what you have discovered with that tool. 
don't just give us the URL, but show us the pretty pictures. What did you find with this tool? Because on average, if you don't use your tool, chances are nobody comes and hits your website and hits your tool. If we know our tools, we should use them first and convince the world what we are finding with our tools. The last part is the hardest for me. It is damn hard to find people who are willing to stake a career on publicly available data. Because for some reason, the minute that data set hits the internet, we think it's valueless. As valueless as like kittens playing piano videos, right? Now, I have to remind everyone in this audience, Podunk University doesn't get grants to write microarrays, to run microarrays. It's our top universities that get these grants to run these molecular assays. These are our peer, peer collaborators that generate most of this data, right? Podunk University doesn't get a grant to do this stuff. These are the best people in the best institutions that are generating most of this data. So it should not be valueless the minute it's publicly available. And what it means is standing on those shoulders and seeing how much further you can get instead of having to rely on generating yet another data set yourself. I'm gonna skip this one. I'm always hiring postdocs, email me if you're curious. A lot of collaborators that we work with, especially an enormous number of folks, uh, Takashi Karawaki, Kyoko Toto, Shiro Maeda and their teams in, in Japan. Uh, with the diabetes story, Honor Suikoder and Julian Sage for the oncology side, Jay Petrick and his team for the GI, those uh, mouse models. Of course, Joel Dudley, Marina Sirota, uh, Keiichi Kodama, and my lab running this work, long list of other collaborators. And my lab has generous endowment support for Lucille Packer Foundation for Children's Health. My lab has 17 NIH grants from these nine institutes of NIH. These four give me more, these five give me less. I still love them. March of Dimes, HV, HHMI. <laughs> Stem cell proposition, all sorts of disease foundations now coming across this approach. I always thank my admin and tech staff. I'd never get a grant or paper out the door without them. And I always thank my wife, a molecular biologist, biochemist, who reads every major paper and grant that comes out of my lab, who starts companies with me now, including the repositioning one, and lets me go all over the place to give talks like this. Thank you very much. Any questions? I left a minute or two, I think. Let's just start a little bit late. Any questions? Go in the middle. That's great. So what, what do we do when it, we get our mo a box of money in terms of the overhead and things like that? So first of all, if I'm ordering, for example, AML serum samples, I don't want that stuff to show up in my office, okay? It's gonna melt, okay, all that ice, that dry ice, right? So, you know, all of our institutions have core facilities on campus, right? Typically, we actually, as informatics folks, end up living in these core facilities, providing services to others. Nobody ever said we couldn't use them either. So we have that stuff just go drop ship directly to core facilities. You get the antibody reagent coming this way, you got the tissue migrate coming this way, they all appear at the same time. You've already worked with them to run that experiment. You, pay, you might have to pay their hourly time. You're right, the overhead is there, right? Compared to just being a one disease lab, it's way bigger overhead. But I also have the flexibility. If I'm interested in uh, you know, nose cancer next week, I'm gonna find a model next week, right? I can, we're agnostic to that disease. And that gives us a potency that tr traditional biologists just can't reach today. They're starting from scratch. There's a question all the way in the back. Yeah, how many sad endings do we have? That, that's a great question. So of the mouse models we run, we've run probably seven or eight mouse models that all end up showing what we thought it was gonna show. So on the mouse side, it's, it's not, but again, we're pulling the trigger on so many experiments, with so many experiments before you even pull the trigger. So if, I added up the other day, we've probably launched 20 biological studies broadly defined in this way, and probably two failed for us. But let's say 18 work for us. You're gonna see a bunch of these as they come out in papers. Now. So I think we're still learning how to do this. I'm gonna be humble here for a second here, right? I think uh, we are learning from realizing that it's getting easier and easier to do this. What took us 18 months now takes us 18 weeks, takes us 18 days, right? Because we realized this is what we should have been doing the first way. So I think we're still learning. All I'm trying to say though, is that if you have the money, you should pull the trigger more on the biology. That's what I would say. I'm also gonna then say as a corollary, my own experience is a lot easier to get that money from folks like NIH if you say you're gonna pull the trigger on some of these things instead of just making it a computational validation. 
you know, put in there AIM-3 is, I got this company willing to do this for me, right? Or I'm going to pay them, of course. Here's their invoice, right? But I think it seems like, at least in my experience, study sections want us to try these things for real and show that experience to the world. That barely answers your question, but I'm trying. I have one question. Surely. That's great. How often pathways are yeah, so the pathways usually comes up as a question too. So we've tried pathways. Profesh Kathri is in my lab. He came up with the original Onto tools. Of course, we love pathways in the lab. I'm getting more and more depressed about pathways though. Okay, why am I going to say this? And it's kind of blunt here for this audience. First of all, CD44, you look at the pathways, they had nothing about diabetes. Okay, we would have totally missed it. And then I started to realize a lot of times we get these unknown genes or genes that are barely curated at the top of the list. I'm worried that the fastest way to lose your innovative finding is to do a pathway analysis. Because only a third of the genes in the genome have any reliable pathway information at all. In fact, we had a paper in PLOS Computation Value. You can look at this review article. We had this graph showing. In fact, the number of genes with accurate gene, uh, genotology classification is dropping over the last 10 years. They're removing annotations, okay? So we're not heading in the right direction at all in terms of pathway information. And that's when we're broadly calling gene ontology a pathway, like a bag of gene kind of thing, right? Forget about even more detailed pathways and you know, directional arrows and all of that. Of course, I'm a huge fan of all of that, right? But I'm also worried that if we just jump to that without looking up these genes, we're going to lose findings. So we've got to know what these genes do beyond the pathways. But if you look at the pathways here for the CD44 story, you get receptor activation, broad stuff that really didn't help. Thank you very much.